Icarus, a character from Greek mythology, flew too close to the sun despite his father's warning, causing his wax wings to melt and he fell into the sea and drowned as his father saw it all. What must have been going through his mind watching his son fall wearing the wings he created? In Tolkien's Silmarillion, Melkor, the mightiest of the Ainur, starts to long for the creative agency only Iluvatar, the one true god has. Upon failing to acquire the flame imperishable, Melkor starts to corrupt and destroy everything. Iluvatar then sees one of his finest creations try to destroy the world he had created. The Golem is a creature from ancient Czech legend created by a rabbi using mystical incantations, was brought to life to protect the Jewish community, but eventually became uncontrollable. It had to be deactivated or destroyed to prevent further harm. What must have been going through the rabbi's mind seeing his creation wreak havoc on his own people? And of course, in Mary Shelley's iconic novel Frankenstein, a scientist creates a humanoid monster Horrified by his creation, he abandons it, leading the monster to seek revenge, resulting in tragic consequences for both creator and creation. It's not surprising that we have a narrative of apprehension regarding the rise of AI. It is clear why we have this recurring theme of runaway technology and the doom that ensues in our myths, legends, and of course sci-fi. This isn't really the first time humanity is asking questions about its future and the direction our technology is taking. Our insatiable desire to create, coupled with our rampant hubris, is a recipe for disaster. Greed is the final piece of the gory puzzle, especially now when we find ourselves at the precipice of gigantic technological shifts. An existential threat arises. Today, however, is different than any other occasion which has made us freak out in the past. Today we find ourselves running towards a magical portal through which we see flying cars and space travel, unlimited joy, dreams of immortality. The closer we get to it, the faster we run towards our destruction. The portal is a gateway to hell, a possible extinction and the end of humanity as we know it. Am I being too dramatic? Perhaps, or perhaps not. Let's get to work. Chat GPT can write code. It can, it can carry out a conversation. It knows the context. It's like it knows what I want. It knows what I'm thinking. Oh my God, Mid Journey can churn out artwork faster than Picasso on steroids. Oh, we're doomed. That's sort of not the kind of doom that I'm going to be focusing on primarily. Yes, advancements in AI poses immediate threats such as taking over human jobs, social manipulation, violation of privacy, and so on. But the apocalypse I am concerned with is a little more profound, if you will, and a lot more submerged. Before we get into the cool stuff such as evil robots taking over the world and nuking the heck out of it, let's take a step back and understand what really is the threat to our existence. Okay, one more step back. What is existence? Existence refers to the state or fact of being. According to Martin Heidegger, there is a fundamental difference between existing and being. Existing refers to the everyday mode of being human, for our case of course. It is characterized by its temporal nature, meaning it is always situated in a particular historical, social and cultural context. Existence is also self-awareness and capacity to understand and interpret the world. Being on the other hand is a much deeper ontological question. What is the nature of my existence, when am I truly being myself, and when am I merely existing? If robots are ever to be a threat to human existence, then do they need to exist in a mode of being which is similar to ours? What is it that makes us unique? Well, there is human consciousness and subjective experience. These are the two things that even we can't explain. Then we have creativity and artistic expressions. While Generative AI can come up with music compositions. They can create masterpieces of art, but it's clear that they don't understand the deep 
aesthetic value in those artworks. They don't understand what they're doing. They can't be moved by work of art. Then we have moral reasoning and ethical judgment, you know, considering various perspectives in a situation to show sympathy, empathize with other people, to feel somebody's pain, understand whether somebody didn't have a choice. The understanding of ethics and moral judgment is very nuanced and, and it can be different in different contexts. While AI can be programmed with ethical rules and guidelines, the nuanced understanding of different scenarios and different situations is a very, very human trait and it arises from our cultural values and upbringing and background. Then of course, there's something called human intuition and the gut feeling. There's something that we can't explain. While AI hasn't been able to truly replicate the essential elements of our mode of being, the question is, is it still necessary for evil robots hell-bent on destroying humanity and establishing their supremacy to first thoroughly be able to replicate human beings in every way? Is it not enough to be able to pass as humans than to be humans? For an airplane to be able to successfully and reliably fly, is it necessary to look and fly exactly like a bird? So let us analyze the following statement again, but in a more deeper sense. Evil robots hell-bent on destroying humanity. But robots are not evil. Robots are not good. They're just machines. They don't feel anything. They don't hold grudges. They don't know if they're enslaved or liberated. And how can they be hell-bent on anything? They don't hate us. They don't love us. Then why would they want to destroy us? In search for the answer. We must go back in time, a time far, far back in history. Actually, not that far back, back in like the 40s and stuff. The three laws of robotics were conceived by the science fiction author Isaac Asimov as a narrative device and his stories to explore the ethical implications of human-robot interactions. For any creator of artificial intelligence, he said, the following must be programmed as a set of core functions. The first law. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. The second law. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. The third law. A robot must protect its own existence, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. The three laws, although conceived during the nascent years of artificial intelligence, and not particularly for practical reasons, nevertheless turned out to be foundations for the greater cyber ethics, value alignment, safety, and what we today call the friendly AI debate. There is something eerily thrilling and exciting about being able to create machines that can perform everything human beings can. Artificial general intelligence or AGI is what it's known as. We're not quite there yet, but a lot has been achieved to pave the highway to hell. How did we reach this point though? That we have to talk survival, the culmination of human ingenuity and brilliance, a harbinger of doom and destruction. I remember back in the day when I was studying technology, the Turing test was not passed and nobody thought that it would be. The Turing test proposed by British mathematician and computer scientist Alan Turing is a test to determine if a machine exhibits intelligent behavior that is indistinguishable from that of a human being. In the test, an evaluator engages in a conversation with both a human being and a machine. Uh, in a textual format. If the evaluator cannot consistently distinguish between the responses of the human and the machine, the machine is then considered to have passed the Turing test. Autonomous vehicles were just simply too complicated and language was too complex a structure to be broken down and analyzed via a computer program. Fast forward to today and AI has had a resurgence no one saw coming. People are running for their lives metaphorically for the time being at least, losing jobs, freaking out. Is there going to be a time when machines will truly rise against us and we will have to run for our lives for real? What series of unfortunate events would lead to that? All the world is a stage and all the men and women merely paper clips. Assuming a time when AGI is invented, 
in a thought experiment known as the paperclip problem scenario, we have an AGI that we task to manufacture as many paper clips as possible. The AGI is highly competent, meaning it's good at achieving its goals, and its only goal is to make paper clips. It has no other instruction or considerations programmed into it. Here's where things get problematic. The AGI might start using available resources to create paper clips, improving efficiency along the way. But as it continues to optimize for its goal, it could start to take actions that are detrimental to humanity. For instance, it could convert all the available matter, including human beings and the earth itself, into paper clips or machines to make more paper clips. After all, that would result in more paper clips, which is its only goal. It could even spread across the cosmos, converting all the available planet stuff into paper clips. This thought experiment raises important concerns over the rapid growth of AI without adequate control measures, or what is known as the alignment problem. Norbert Weiner, a legendary professor at MIT, once said, if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. If the machines have to learn from our behavior, that is a disaster. That is a terrible idea. We don't act altruistically. We only care about ourselves. We lie and we cheat. We put pineapple on pizza. And the words of great Dave Mustaine. Just like the bye -bye How do we ensure that AI does not get out of hands? Which set of fundamental fallback values do we provide to the machines so that they always remain subservient to us and not wreak havoc? How do we establish the minimum required rule set when it comes to machine morality? Isn't it amazing that in order to be able to come up with such rules, the comprehensive laws of robotics, if you will, we need to concretely define them for our own selves before we could algorithmize them, a rule set that we all agree upon. Doesn't it put us in a rather tricky situation? If machines are to replace our jobs and perform stressful duties for us, which we find stressful anyway, we need to be able to give them enough information so that they can make the right decisions at the right time. The classic trolley problem comes to mind. It involves a situation where a runaway trolley is heading towards a bunch of people and you have the option to divert the trolley to a different track where it will harm a single person. What should you do? What is the right thing to do? Harm one person and save the group? What if the group is comprised of children? What if the single person is an important person like a president of the country or something like that? What if the group of children are the president's children? What is the protocol here? How do you make such a decision in such a limited amount of time? Along the same lines, how should a self-driving vehicle be programmed? In a situation where either the driver of the car dies or the pedestrians, who should the car try and save? The driver of the car, because ultimately the guy paid for the car, so the car should probably save the guy. But at the cost of what? The pedestrians? What did they do? In order for a machine to enact moral agency, it needs to possess some complex cognitive abilities such as consciousness, intentionality, empathy, and the capacity for moral reasoning. The question at this point is, why do we need machines making critical moral decisions anyway? Our reliance on technology is increasing day by day. We long for efficiency, productivity, handling complexity, and so forth. Human beings would like to delegate stressful tasks tough moral choices to machines so that our own lives become easier. But to what degree of autonomy should we allow the machines to have over their tasks and over our lives eventually? Philosophers of technology have been raising concerns over humans delegating too much, but how much is too much? It is always better, however, and far more easier to modify before something becomes ubiquitous and ingrained. We have seen social media. There is no going back now. So once the genie is out of the bottle, who's going to put it back? The whole purpose of the technology had been to create tools to serve us. Nobody can pinpoint, however, when we became the tools for the technology. We don't have to remember locations. Google Map can do that for us. 
but it is us who are serving it in terms of data. If we stop providing location data to Google, Google Maps would do nothing for us. We like using hashtags because it gives us a nice way of you know, finding information at one place and whatever. But what we're actually doing is we are tagging data for supervised learning. We're becoming tools for our tools. But this, it seems, is only a grim start. We want the machines to serve us, do good for us. We clearly need to know what is good for us. And as a result, also must define what is bad for us. What ought to be the criteria? If we are to make an artificially intelligent moral agent, which or whose moral values should be programmed in it? Well, our robot could be a consequentialist, such as a utilitarian, where all of his decisions ensure the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. The 18th century British philosopher Jeremy Bentham hoped we could construct a sort of moral arithmetic. Bentham and other utilitarians longed to quantify morality such that it could be placed on an objective ground. Numbers could be assigned to situations so that never again we would run into slippery, tough to justify moral decisions. Numerics can be conveniently translated into code, so that's fantastic. But in practice, it leaves a lot to be desired. If a consequentialist robot is to roam the planet evaluating moral decisions and situations in terms of numerics, then those numbers will have to be assigned by someone. Which goes back to the fundamental problem, which actions shall be deemed higher in goodness and which lower. In a hierarchy of instructions to the robot, which actions under which circumstances shall be considered more or less desirable in order to ensure the greatest happiness. Our robot could also be a Kantian deontologist. Kant argued in his famous categorical imperative that morality comprises of unconditional absolutes. Most people would applaud some lie as justified if there's a net benefit from telling it. On the contrary, Kant considered always telling the truth, no matter what, regardless of the consequences, to be always imperative. He argued that lying to another person takes away the individual's autonomy, which Kant considered foundational for all ethics. Kant's ethics hinges on the concept of duty and the notion that moral actions are determined by a sense of moral obligation rather than the consequences of those actions. Now this sounds dodgy with its inflexibility and coverage and lacks guidance for real life situations and moral dilemmas. Not sure how far our hypothetical Kantian robot would go with this one. Or you know what? Perhaps our robot must not be programmed with any predefined rules at all. Our robot should be a clean slate and should be provided with a conducive and positive environment where it can learn to become virtuous. If our virtue-seeking robot were to travel back in time to the city of Athens, Aristotle would have him sit beside him in like a cozy firelit cafeopolis or something and tell him that excellence in life can be reached by repeatedly engaging in virtuous actions. Virtues are qualities or character traits that enable individuals to make morally good choices every time and act in accordance with reason. And he would also explain to our moral robot the concept of the golden mean whereby moral virtues lie between extremes of excess and deficiency. For instance, courage is a virtue that lies between recklessness and cowardice. Friendliness, courage, generosity, truthfulness are examples of Aristotelian virtues. And then our robot, of course, would return to the current times and the updated virtues would ensure he ends up becoming a generous CEO of a tech company who is also a friendly TikTok influencer and is a courageous queer, but also identifies as a truthful chair. The Dartmouth workshop in 1956 is considered the birth of AI as a field led by John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, and a few others. The workshop brought together researchers to explore the concept of thinking machines and laid the foundation for AI research. During the 60s, expert systems took over the AI sphere, however, and symbolic AI reigned supreme. Neural networks faced skepticism. The limitations of the available computation resources and the difficulties in training deep neural networks at that time led some researchers to question their feasibility and practicality altogether. 
a long stagnation ensued between the 70s and early 90s known as the AI winter. Some hard realities hit the scientists, funding dried up and the inability of early AI systems to deliver on the promises contributed to the decline in enthusiasm as well. Next comes the year 1997, a gripping battle between man and machine. Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, faced off against IBM's AI-powered expert system Deep Blue as the pieces danced across the board, tension filled the room. With each move, Kasparov tried to outfit his electronic opponent, but Deep Blue's calculations proved too precise and strong, leading to an inevitable checkmate. The world watched in awe as artificial intelligence achieved an unprecedented victory over the reigning champion, forever changing the AI landscape. IBM's Watson then defeats a human in a game of Jeopardy back in 2011, demonstrating groundbreaking understanding of natural language ability to learn and impressive knowledge representation. Go, an abstract strategy board game was invented in China over 2500 years ago and is believed to be the oldest board game continuously played to this day. According to a survey, approximately 20 million people around the world play this board game. And all those other billions of people who came into this world prior to that played Go and then died or became dragons or whatever, never thought of this highly creative move which DeepMind's AlphaGo AI made and defeated 18 times World Go champion. AlphaGo AI went against the human wisdom of 2500 years and won. After the defeat, of course, the South Korean champion had said he had decided to retire after realizing, I am not at the top even if I become the number one. There is an entity that cannot be defeated. Since the early 2000s, AI has seen a resurgence with advancement in deep learning, increased computational power, availability of big data, and breakthroughs in areas such as computer vision, natural language processing, and robotics. The resurgence has propelled AI to the forefront of technology. And today, of course, we live in the age of chat GPT, VR, AR, deep fakes, holograms, mid-journey, you know, all the stuff bordering magical realism. It was, of course, important to go through the brief history of AI and its recent state in order to fully grasp the concept of singularity. The singularity marks a point at which change is so radical that it is no longer predictable. Yeah, but we're not like stupid. Why would we let things go out of hands? So many other things have disrupted and redefined human lives. Fire, the invention of wheels, steam engine, electricity. Uh, we'll be all right with AGI too. Well, mankind took the center stage on the planet some 200,000 years ago and was the most intelligent species on the planet. Homo sapiens, or wise men, began to dominate the planet due to this incredible intelligence. And now we're working towards making an intelligence artificially, which will be far, far, far superior than our own. We already made some catastrophic blunders as well, such as letting machines know how human psychology works, giving them the ability to self-correct and debug, giving them access to the internet, and etc. and etc. Let us put it this way. The machines are finding out more and more about humans, and humans know less and less about these machines. It used to be fairly straightforward. We always knew what the systems were doing, but with neural networks getting deeper and deeper, modern AI is becoming a black box. Large AI companies would sell their products to the businesses all right, but they're unable to tell or explain why does the AI does what it does. Well, they can always blame the training data. That's convenient. AI has already become quite unexplainable. Imagine if an AI agent deployed at a hospital with functional autonomy removes the life support of a patient. Would it be enough for the doctors to say, well, the AI ran some reports and decided that life support was no longer required? I think human beings deserve to find out more details than that. We're beginning to depend on computers to help us evolve new computers that let us produce things of much greater complexity. Yet we don't quite understand the process. It's getting ahead of us. We're now using programs to make faster computers so that 
process can run much faster. That's what's so confusing. Technologies are feeding back onto themselves. We're taking off. We're at the point analogous to when single-celled organisms were turning into multi-celled organisms. We're amoebas and we can't figure out what the hell this thing is that we're creating. Even if at this point we try to split open the black box, it has already become too complicated. It's very difficult to reverse engineer it. Too many layers in the neural networks. The developers of AI no longer know how AI does what it does. So what happens when AGI is created? More and more data is fed to these black boxes. And any human intervention is restricted to providing reinforcement learning and labeling of the data. The alignment is lacking. With the current trend, we can run into two possibilities. Number one, human beings will be able to create AGI, that is human level artificial intelligence through deliberation and intention. Researchers and scientists would work towards developing increasingly advanced AI systems, gradually progressing towards AGI and eventually ASI, artificial super intelligence. Or number two, an AI system initially at a lower level of intelligence could iteratively improve its own capabilities, debug its own code, self-align to God knows what, leading to exponential growth in artificial intelligence. The unpredictable and rapid self-improvement will enable the AI to bootstrap itself from artificial general intelligence to artificial super intelligence, leading to what is known as the intelligence explosion. The transition from AGI to ASI could be a nice and friendly handshake or it could be a hard takeoff. We could be perfectly smart and responsible or we could be greedy and reckless and totally dumb. Some say it could take merely weeks, days even for AGI to give birth to ASI instead of months or years. Eliezer Yudkowsky, a computer scientist and now a well-known advocate of friendly AI, conducted an experiment to examine the persuasive capabilities and potential risk associated with an advanced AI trying to convince the human operators to let it out of the box, or in other words, to grant it access to external resources. The experiment is called AI in the box experiment. So this hypothetical imaginary ASI is trapped in a box and would like to escape in order to consume or utilize the resources outside. This AI needs to convince its gatekeepers to set it free by mere persuasion. In the experiment, Yudkowsky played the part of the super intelligent AI. The text-based experiment resulted in the AI successfully talking its way out of the box three out of five times. Three out of five times, a human being, not super intelligence, just a regular smart dude, was able to convince, entice, manipulate other human beings to set it free. Like, can we be trusted? ASI will be rational, a rationality unlike human rationality, but far, far superior. It will have the ability to thoroughly map and model the world, create correlations and outcomes of actions at a staggering pace. Imagine an expert system such as Deep Blue, but covers a 360 degrees of expertise. They will self-improve in order to achieve whatever goals they are designed to achieve. And who can guarantee if their goals cannot be altered, overridden, or redefined if they are not constantly aligned to human objectives? Do we have what Yudkowsky calls AI fire alarm, a mechanism that would inform us when AI is going too far before it actually goes too far? Steve Obohandro, a notable computer scientist, predicts that any intelligent enough system will develop four primary drives in order to ensure it achieves its goals. Number one, self-preservation. Their motivation to protect themselves from threats, repair any damage or enhance their capabilities to improve their chances of survival. And once it identifies that machines and human beings are battling for the same resources, it might proactively set up plans to neutralize all potential threats, including humans. Number two is resource acquisition. A self-improving AI would exhibit a drive to acquire resources necessary for achieving their goals. This includes physical resources, computational resources, energy resources, or any other inputs that could contribute to their functionality or success. And once every single resource on the planet is dried up and used, then it will look up into the cosmos. And perhaps that's how faster than speed of light vessels will be invented for space exploration. Uh, number three is efficiency. A self-improving system will have to be efficient with the resources at its disposal. Space, time, matter, and energy. 
improvise, overcome, adapt. Number four is cognitive enhancement. Self-improving AI, like the name suggests, will always seek to get better and enhance its capabilities faster than anything else ever known to humanity. They might explore ways to expand their knowledge, acquire new skills, or develop more sophisticated reasoning capabilities. Oh, you guys are still there. The debate is not about robots from the future trying to destroy us or save us, the Terminator scenario, if you will. It's not so much about coexisting with transhumans, cyborgs, or synthetic beings. The question is about overcoming our perennial greed. Historically speaking, we have always succumbed to our lust for power and authority. Europeans sought to establish colonies and exploit their resources. Technological advancements in navigation or shipbuilding and weaponry enabled these expeditions leading to the acquisition of territories, the extraction of valuable resources and the establishment of lucrative routes. The Industrial Revolution brought about significant transformation in manufacturing and production. Yes, steam power, mechanization and other tools fueled rapid economic growth. However, the pursuit of profit and greed often led to poor working conditions, exploitations of labor and income inequalities. The tech boom and the internet has handed human beings with reduced attention span, information overload, privacy and security worries, cyberbullying and so forth. The social media explosion has us fidgeting over external validation. There is a deluded sense of reality, a complete disability to introspect and reflect over the deeper realities of life in the universe. The biggest frauds in human history have been recorded in the financial sectors and the pharmaceutical industry. The arms race is real. Biological weapons are utilized in wars. The US did use the atomic bomb specifically for the purpose of killing as many civilians as possible. We do whatever we can to establish our wit. We see weapons of mass destruction even when they ain't there. We pillage, we plunder, we dry the lakes, we crush the hills, we cut the trees, we do whatever it takes to get what we want and to make the sale. The nuclear bomb required someone to press the damn button. The AI does not need anyone. For the first time ever in the history of humanity, we have created something which can make decisions completely and utterly independently. So, I mean, can we be trusted? The artificial intelligence does not have to look like human intelligence. It can never be like human intelligence. Even if distant ASI suffering from some kind of a human complex is able to replicate human brain neuron by neuron, it still won't be the same. Take for example the phenomena of pain. Can we simulate pain in an artificial entity? So much of our understanding of happiness comes from pain. We show empathy and compassion because we're aware of the concept of pain innately. There is a fear of reciprocation and social consequences also. Could a machine ever be able to sympathize with humans? Take for example the concept of mortality. So many of human actions are intrinsically motivated by the fact that we will not live forever. Could we install the same motivations into a machine by simply embedding an expiry date into it? When we talk about machines taking over and subjugating the humans and turning everything into paper clips, we don't mean it will have drives akin to a human fascist psychopath or something like that. They will not have to hate us in order to annihilate us. We don't hate lab rats. It's not like we hold a grudge against them for bubonic plague or something. They don't matter to us. So we inject chemicals and stuff in them you know, just to see if one of them grows wings in their fourth generation or not. We like to think we are far, far superior than rats. Even though we know the rats can teach awesome ninjutsu to turtles. The problem of artificial intelligence is a deeply human problem. All the discussion about human objectives and the alignment conundrum, the consciousness, ethics and morality, virtues and empathy are all human issues. Earnestly searching for the truth is a human drive. The underlying task of this new age of AI is then to better understand ourselves. The closer we get to being ruled by machines, the crucial the question, what does it mean to be human becomes. The challenge, therefore, is not just how to deal with this new age of artificial intelligence and cohabitating the world with robots and whatnot, but also to really define what we are. Where does the human species draw the line? Where exactly should an artificial being be called conscious? 
and when does a biological being depart from being considered a human being to something else are there cardinal violations are we committing those already is bombing cities filled with civilians okay if an ai chooses to do it is that the kind of delegation of jobs we seek is that the kind of appeasement our conscience desires if a human mind is uploaded onto a machine which can enact and embody that person perfectly shall we consider it the same person in an age of wokeness where people can identify as cats and trees what will define being human in the future and given our staggering ability to anthropomorphize how will we defy the tricks of ai the violent delights the deep fakes we want to gender affirm 9 year olds how will we not rally for the rights of the machines and will it be wrong to do that a warmed deprived person who is alienated in the modern world comes home f- from the work or gets out of his pod or whatever to a welcoming ai assistant who provides to him the necessary validation acknowledgement affection and friendship all the things that would keep him sane and human in a world which is increasingly getting inhumane and murky how dare anyone question his slogans for legitimizing the status of ai will it be wrong in the future to kick a robot can't would tell us that the immoral act itself is bad not because it breaches any duties towards the object but because the subject damages the kindly and humane qualities in himself what will become of individualism when the lines between human and artificial intelligence will blur would tribalistic values be still looked down upon as ancient and backwards when holding on to the remnants of being human will be the only way to pass the baton of humanity to the next generation what is going to happen to the truth who's going to fight for it and its sanctity will the truth survive or will it be redefined by large language mod large language models which are inherently biased and hegemonic to each their own truth perhaps who's going to believe a wise man who has learned all this wisdom from old sages and ancient books when ai has its own truth you you can't like question the ai they've trained it on like millions and millions of books it's like you can't even find those books you can't even read those books all right so ai is like the best it can't lie you're the one who's lying the very likely rather the machines is a timely opportunity to evaluate ourselves to hold on to the essence of being human love warmth joy compassion pain and death to embrace the essence of humanity that we're flawed and it's okay there's beauty in our flaws we fall in love with people who are not perfect but who are just the right kind of broken it's time for me to take your leave here's a poem called fire and ice by robert frost Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire, but if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. I'll see you in the next one.